a quick little overview of our fiber optic network design tool that we call fond so you can see it runs in my web browser here and to create a new design I'm just going to open a new project uh, so the first thing I'll do with this project is give it a meaningful name and uh, then we'll go through this three-step process so the first step in the process is to uh, select or create a new architecture so the architecture is a set of rules that describe how we're going to what equipment we're going to use and how we're going to link it all together so it's things like what size cabinet we're we using um, what sort of splitters would we be putting in the cabinet are we using a fully spliced or a connectorized solution what size terminals are we using and what's the maximum drop distance between the subscriber and the the drop terminal and the second step will bring in input data so input data tells fond uh, the subscriber location so where fond needs to run the drop to as well as what are the valid cable paths that Fond can run cables along. And we can tell it that by uploading poles and spans. Um, we could also upload any existing underground path that you might like to follow, as well as using street center lines or generating um, a dual-sided uh, base, net base network. Uh, and then the third step is we'll hit the generate design button and then iterate on that design a little bit by adding a bit of extra information to it that we learn from throughout the design process. So I'll, uh, we've got a few different options here on the left that we could choose from existing architectures that we might have configured. I'm going to go ahead and create a new architecture, um, but if you if you had already created an architecture that you liked in a previous project, you could use it again in a, in a new project. So this new architecture, I'm going to give a very original name of Demo2. And um, I could give it a description as well. This is useful if you wanted to describe how you might use this uh, this architecture to a colleague of yours, you might want to say this is going to be useful in a rural area, so maybe I'll just type that useful in rural area. Um, so there's three steps here, there's a tier 1, tier 2, tier 3. Tier 1 is our drop tier, so we designed the, the drop tier first, um, so that's all the rules around what size drop closures we're using, the maximum drop length and things like that. Uh, step 2 is then the distribution tier, so that's going to have uh, any rules around how we connect those drop terminals back to the fiber distribution hub and then tier 3 is our feeder tier that's connecting everything from the fiber distribution hub back to the central office uh, so pretty standard sort of rules here <clears throat> we mostly will you be using a tier 1 uh, a, sorry a uh, single fiber cable for the drop cable we can set the maximum drop length we want to have so I could set that to be 500 feet as an example and we could also, if we were using an aerial network, we could limit the number of poles within a single tier one cable. So limiting the number of spans between the drop terminal and the subscriber. Um, we can also set the maximum number of, or the, 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 the number of ports that we would like to have on each of our drop terminals. So I'll just leave this at being four and eight, but we might decide we want to use just, uh, we might want to keep two of those ports spare in the network. We could decide to put a splitter in this terminal, but in this case, I'm just going to set it to none. I'm going to put the splitter in our tier 2 cabinet, um, so I'll set that to be a 1 by 32 splitter, so that's in our, in our fiber distribution hub, and uh, we'll use a, a, either a 144 or a 288 port cabinet in this example. So Fon's going to always try to use the, the 288 port cabinet, it's trying to use as few cabinets as possible, so what we can do is also put a, a about 10% spare in there um, to make sure that we're leaving, leaving, leaving some room for growth there. We can also put some spare in our cables, so I can say we'll leave 10% of fibers being spare in our cables. And then we can uh, set a maximum, a threshold on how much cable we're willing to run in parallel to avoid a splice. So there are times where you might run a cable out of a cabinet to an intersection and branch, uh, one to the north and one to the south. We could avoid placing that splice closure if we just run those two cables in parallel. So I'm just going to set a threshold of 500 feet as an example, and so that will allow Fond to run two cables in parallel for 500 feet in order to avoid a branching splice. So you can play around with that variable um, to suit your own costs to, f to find what works best for your network. And then tier three, that's our feeder network. So I'll use a, a 432 fiber rather than a 576. I might use 20% spare in this tier and use a thousand foot parallel cable threshold, parallel cable threshold there and then that's ready to use so I can use this in this project here but I could also create a new project and reuse this architecture there as well 
So uh, moving on to step two. So you can see here we've got the option to upload any existing aerial spans and poles and upload any existing addresses. Um, and that's, so that's great if you've got that data available. If you don't though, we can use the area select feature. So the area select feature, you can see the light areas on the map. So most of the United States, this is where we have existing parcel data. So with that, we can pull in um, the, all the parcels and they're gonna represent our subscriber locations. Uh, so I'm just going to go to this little area in Maine to do this on the coast. It looks nice, Old Orchard Beach. So I'm just going to draw a polygon around this area. So when I'm drawing, while I'm drawing this polygon, Fond is um, trying to download all the parcels that we have in this area, as well as the street center lines. So it's going to use the parcels and it's going to pull out the, the centroid of that parcel to represent the subscriber location. And then it's going to use the street center lines as being candidate path for Fond to follow. So if I tick that little box there, we can see all of the orange lines. These are going to be the candidate paths that Fond can follow. So I hit import. We can see the parcels. All right. So... Now within each of these parcels, we've got these little white address points. So each of them are getting a, just a single fiber. This one here, we can see it must have been, must be an MDU. It's getting 10, so it's an apartment. It's getting 10, uh, it's going to get 10 fibers because it's an apartment building. Um, we could also change it if we wanted. We could say that this is actually a duplex and give that uh, two fibers. So what we've done here is basically prepared our input data and it's re ready to run. Um, so final thing I might do is just place the central office and I'll just draw that on the map, maybe maybe near the park. I don't know, that's probably a terrible place to put one. So I drop that central office there and now I'll hit generate design. So what Fon's doing here is it's, uh, first thing it does is take all of the geospatial data we've uploaded and use it to create a, a candidate network. It's gonna have all the potential paths that Fon can run cables. The second thing it'll do is then it'll start placing the drop terminals. And it's trying to place those drop terminals in a way that reduces the total number of terminals, um, but also respects those rules that we set. So it's gonna to try to use as few terminals as possible, but no more than eight homes per terminal. And no more than, um, in this example, with the architecture we set, no more than 500 feet between the address location and the terminal. Now, Fon will it'll break that 500 foot um, distance if it needs to, and it has to connect every address. So we can see here we've got an address point that's sitting quite far away from the from the underground path. So Fon will run a longer drop there if it needs to. But in general, it's not going to break that rule and it, it'll keep all the addresses within that 500 foot limit. Uh, the second thing it'll do is it'll connect all of the drop closures back up to the cabinet. And again, it's trying to use as few of those cabinets as possible. Um, with But within that while trying to stay within that um, 288 addresses per cabinet plus that 10% spare. And then it'll connect all of those cabinets back up to the central office. So while that's running, I'm going to use a, uh, a slightly, going to jump to a different area and show how we can use, if we already have our own um, geospatial data with poles and addresses, how we might use that. So I'll create a new project. And I'll give that a different name, which is going to be demo with Arial. And I'm just going to use the same the same architecture that we created in the previous in the previous design. So this 288 port cabinet with the one by 32 splitter. So I'll use that. So I'll upload um, our addresses firstly. So um, just I'm, I'm, I'm uploading these as a shape file, but you can upload them as a KML if you would prefer. So I'll upload the addresses. So these could be um, any meter locations that you get from a utility or from a co-op. Um, or it could be the centroids of parcels that you've collected yourself. Or it could be field verified address location data as well. The next thing I'll do is upload all of our aerial spans and poles. So the aerial spans I'll upload as a shape file and the poles I'll upload as a shape file. Now if you only had the poles and you didn't have the spans that's okay. Fon can infer where the aerial spans would run but it's ideal to use uh, 
Aerial Spandar if you can get it because that's already validated what two poles can be used to to run a cable between them. So there's not going to be span between two poles if there's also a tree between those two poles. So it gives you a bit of extra certainty around around your design. So it's really important uh, whenever you can to make sure your input data is as accurate as possible. That means that when you run the design, it's using this input data and it's going to create a design that's going to be more accurate. Um, so for example, there's this pole down here that doesn't have, you can see it clearly on the map in red, it doesn't have any span attached to it. So that's an error in the input data, but I can go through here and just click on that and connect that together to fix that up. Now that address is going to be serviceable from this pole. So I'll click finish. And I'll just um, point out as well, so we've got some addresses that aren't aren't close to the pole line. So that's because this is this was a, that could be an existing power network where the primary conductors are all on aerial so we could add some secondary by uploading um, some underground underground paths so yeah this could be an existing power network and we're just just trying to follow that existing path so now we can see with this orange these orange lines are providing candidate paths to the address locations and the the blue lines here are providing candidate paths as well to addresses that are near, near those. And I'll just add a central office location again. I'll just draw that on the map um, near the airport. It seems like a better better place. I'll hit finish and then we'll hit generate design. Okay, so while that's running, I'm just going to jump back to the design we were working on earlier and see if that's finished. It should be if I hit refresh. Okay, so that's just downloading the design. Uh, all right, so let's have a look at the design here. I'll turn some layers off. All right, so we can see we've got these drop terminals connecting all of the, the addresses um, via these red drop cables back up to the, the, the hub location. So this one's... Now remember, we had a, eight ports per drop terminal, but a max, but we're also allowing two two spare ports to be reserved. So the maximum we can have is six. So we should see most of these drop terminals being packed with um, up to six addresses, especially in, in the high density area downtown. A little bit further out of town, we might expect to see um, a lower packing. So this one's just got five five homes connected back to it. Um, you see this MDU here is just being connected directly to the distribution cable um, without using a drop terminal. And so all of these drop terminals and the MDUs are being connected back up to um, the cabinet location here. And then, so this cabinet location, we can see it's got 248 homes connected back to it. So that's where those, those splitters will be. And then the cabinet itself gets connected back to the central office, which is replaced by the park via the, the blue tier three cable or feeder cable. Now we might say that these cabinet locations uh, so Fon's done its best to place the cabinet location in what it thinks is a good central location, but we might know better. As a designer, you might know that the cabinet is better off being placed down here. So I can just go in and drag that cabinet down the road. <clears throat> and similarly, we might say that the drop closures, um, so let's, let's find an example. We might say we'd prefer this drop closure to be over here, so I'll just move that down the road. So what that allows us to do is to, to use automation to generate the, the design to the point where it's quite good and then use our own knowledge of the, the area to, to improve the design by adding more information. Uh, so one other, one other thing we can do is, is influence the design. So we can see here that Fond is crossing the railway at two locations. We might, we might actually prefer just, well, we would prefer that Fond only cross the design only cross the railroad in one spot. So I'll go in here and um, with the underground path, I'll set that to be a void. So what this means is Fonda is going to have to pay 10 times the amount it would normally pay to cross that road. And then down here, I'll, I'm going to also set this to be a void. And then at this one as well. So Fonda's still going to be able to cross at one of these crossings, but it's going to have to choose just a single one now.
because we're telling it to avoid every single one. So now let's go ahead and update the design. So we've moved a few cabinet, we've moved a cabinet and a, a drop terminal. So you, you might want to do more than that. Um, but once you finish moving all your cabinets and drop terminals to the preferred location and set um, any any underground path to have the, the avoid or prefer, um, we can we can rerun the design. So what we want to see happen here is that Fond choose just a single one of these crossings rather than trying to cross both. So let's see how that goes. It runs a little bit quicker the second time because we've locked in all of the terminal and cabinet locations. When we moved those t those terminals and the cabinets, we said to Fond, this is where you have to place these devices. Um, and so now it all has all that Fond has to think about is where are the cables going to run. So that's what it's doing now. And it's using that new information that we provided that that these are actually expensive to cross. Before it didn't know that. We hadn't told it that it would be expensive to cross the railroad, um, but, but now it knows. So you don't have to just do that for railroad crossings. It could be that you know that going down past the school is going to be particularly inconvenient and so you want to avoid running cables down that route. Or it could be the opposite. You know that you've already got some existing cables running down Main Street, or maybe not Main Street, but down First Street, and you want to prefer that route so that you can, th so that you can uh, utilize those existing assets. Uh, and when you are preferring a route, you're giving Fond uh, an incentive to use it, and when you're using it, the avoid, uh, you're, you're taxing it. Okay, so let's see the new design. So you can see that it hasn't used this crossing here or this crossing here, but it's, it is using this crossing down here. So it just crossed to that single location for the Tier 2, and then the Tier 3, um, it's crossed here. So to, to get away from that, what I would probably do is just um, I'd move the equipment, I'd move this cabinet down here. And that should take care of that. So just jumping back to the the aerial design, so we can see that uh, so Fond is using is running the cables along along the pole line here, as well as running it along these underground segments. Uh, so what this means is that in the bill of materials we can count up the the cables based on not only their size, so we can count the cables that are size 1 to 24 or greater than that, um, but also whether they're running aerially or underground so that we can apply different costs to those cables. Now this is just an example bill of materials. Any user of Fond has got their own version of the bill of materials with their own equipment IDs and costs and descriptions. Um, and essentially, you can most most quantities that you want to be able to calculate, we can configure a rule that, that, that maps the uh, maps the elements on the map, these very abstract terms like tier 3, tier 2 and tier 1 to quite specific terms that might correspond with a with a, an equipment ID from a catalogue. Uh, finally what we can do is download the um, the design, we can download the the geospatial design we see here as a shapefile or KML or GeoJSON, we can download the, the bill of materials as a CSV to feed back into your own financial models and we can download the splice table and you can use that to import into an existing fiber management system that you might have um, or a documentation system. Uh, and then you can use all of that to move forward into the next stage of your design process.